first of all, let me welcome all of you for coming today and thank you for joining us. We'd like to thank both the Friends of the Gleason Public Library and the Friends of the Council on Aging for making these sessions possible. And we look forward to doing more with Dr. Gianetti and hope that next time we are all in person. Uh, just to do a little bit of housekeeping, Jennifer um, will be moderating the technology and making sure that if we have problems that um, she will take care of it and she will mute all of us. So if we aren't speaking, uh, then we'll definitely be muted so we don't have feedback. And she will also monitor the chat room for the questions at the end, assuming that we have time. And with no further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Jason Dianetti. He is an immigration attorney from Brookline and he's been practicing for 17 years. He has his Juris Doctor degree from Boston College Law School, a Master's of Theological Studies from Harvard Divinity School, and a Master's in Near Eastern and Judaic Studies from Brandeis. So we are very happy to have him today and are thrilled that he's returning with us. Thank you so much, Angela. Can everybody hear me? If you can just raise your hands and say, yes, I hear you. There's, that's great. All right. It's great to see so many of you back again. And I also want to thank the people who sent me emails. Um, if any of you tried to send me an email and I didn't respond, it means that I didn't get it. So I will give out my email address again at the end of this session so that if you do have a question, you can uh, send it to me. Um, thank you to the Gleason Library and the Council on Aging for having me back again. Uh, I was just saying to Angela that when I woke up this morning, I was actually grateful that we were doing this on Zoom because it was so rainy and windy out that uh, it made it a little bit easier to connect with all of you. Um, but now the sun has come out and I'm regretting that I'm not driving out to Carlisle because it's so beautiful this time of year. Um, last time we did a very, very brief thumbnail sketch of immigration in the United States. Uh, from the founding of the United States right up through to the um, enactment of the most recent iteration of immigration laws in, I believe it was 1967. It was slightly changed, but pretty much the same thing through the 80s and uh, right up until the Trump era. Today, we're going to deal with the burning questions that many of you might have about immigration since 2016. Uh, what has changed? What's going on? Uh, what we see on the horizon? That sort of thing. I have an, a special perspective being a practitioner of immigration law in uh, Massachusetts. And if you have any questions about that, I won't give away any confidentiality about any of my clients, but I'll be happy to uh, let you know what I see uh, as somebody on the front lines of that. Many of you may have watched or might have chosen to skip the debate from last night, but let me give you one uh, talking point about the debate. Interestingly enough, uh, at least for me, one topic that didn't come up was immigration. The only way that it came up last night was in a roundabout way talking about uh, Trump shutting down uh, people coming to the United States from China back in February due to COVID. Uh, other than that, I was watching pretty carefully. I didn't see any discussion about immigrants or immigration, which is um, interesting in that uh, only a few years ago, immigration was the front headlines just about every single day uh, that you picked up the paper. I want to go over some of the changes that have taken place under the Trump administration that have to do with immigration. Um, I will begin this by putting my cards on the table. Uh, there's no point in trying to present this in a neutral way 
Uh, and even if I were to present it in a neutral way, uh, it would be disingenuous and you'd probably see through it anyway. I'll unmute. Um, I still can't hear anything. Can everybody hear me okay? Um, the unmute is for you to talk, not for... I okay. understand. I'm hearing a little bit of, of, of chatter in the background. I'm not sure what that's from. But as I was saying, uh, putting my cards on the table, I am no big fan of the current administration. Um, I feel as if, especially with regard to immigration, they have um, enacted policies that are not only contrary to what has been American policy with regard to immigration since the end of World War II, but also are contrary to uh, certain human rights, such as are in, enacted in the Geneva Accords and other uh, international law. Um, as you may have gotten a sense when we talked about this last time, America is a story of two states, right? A, a tale of two countries, you might say. There are those who are uh, for immigration or those who are at least benign towards it. Um, and there has been throughout American history, a strain that has been anti-immigrant, uh, especially in times of economic troubles, especially in times of cultural transition, uh, in times of cultural upheavals. And we went over some of the historical moments of uh, those two states as uh, they progressed through the 18th and 19th centuries in our last talk. Um, we are at one of those crossroads today. Um, there was the Great Recession of 2008, uh, and that certainly was one of the impetus behind the anti-immigrant sentiment that gained popularity, I would propose. Um, we are in the midst of a great demographic change. Uh, people have called it the browning of America. Uh, we are destined to be a majority minority country in the near future. And this is something that is causing, I would submit, great psychic trauma to a lot of the population. And uh, as a result, we have seen certain reactionary movements to this cultural transformation uh, and to our economic transformation. I'm reminded of a cartoon that was popular not too long ago. It showed uh, three people sitting around a table. Uh, there was a banker, there was a worker, like a blue collar worker, and there was an immigrant. And the banker had 19 chocolate chip cookies and the blue collar worker had one. And the banker gets up to walk away and says to the blue collar worker, if I were you, I'd watch out for that guy. I think he wants to take your cookie. Um, now that is clearly an oversimplification perhaps, but given the distribution of wealth in this country, given its uh, uneven distribution uh, skewed greatly towards the top 1% and the, as we've been hearing lately in the news, the uh, uh, very low taxes that are paid for that upper echelon of the 1%, um, we can see some truth in that cartoon. Um, it's very easy to point at the new person in the room as being the threat when there is a certain amount of uh, deception taking place as to where all of that wealth is going. But I'll get off of my soapbox for now and talk a little bit about some of the policies that have happened since 2016. First of all, we talked last time about legal immigration and we talked about two different ways that people can come into this country to immigrate. In other words, to become people who live here, uh, make their homes here. One of those ways is through family. This is derogatorily 
portrayed as quote unquote chain migration. But really what it is, is family connections. And we talked last time about what those family connections are. They're not what you would think they are. Grandparents don't count. Um, cousins, uncles, aunts, nieces, nephews, they do not count. Uh, the only relatives that count uh, are parents, children, spouses, and to some extent, siblings. Even though if uh, you come here as a sibling uh, to somebody who's a US citizen, you could end up waiting between 10 and 12 years before your number is up for you to get that green card. So that's one way, is through families. Another way is through work, uh, through visas that are granted, um, some of them immigrant visas through employers. Since 2016, the legal immigration to the, to the United States has decreased by half. Immigration is down 49% from where it was in 2016. Now, some of this we might attribute to the, the more recent COVID uh, pandemic, but the facts were already in place before the COVID pandemic hit. And under the Trump administration, those numbers for legal immigration to the United States were already sharply declining. There's a number of different reasons for it. And one of the things that I'm seeing in my practice is that when somebody comes to the United States and applies for a green card or what it's actually called a lawful permanent resident um, status, the application process has been slowed down significantly. There have been, uh, there have been a large number of what we call in the business RFEs, requests for evidence where USCIS, uh, United States Citizen and Immigration Service, which is the uh, branch that takes care of these applications, uh, their officers have been sending back applications uh, for very, very minute uh, uh, reasons. Something as little as you left question number 13 blank instead of writing not applicable. Uh, so the entire application gets sent back and everything gets slowed down. One of the results of this unprecedented bureaucratic slowdown is that these applications don't get processed. They take much longer to process and it creates a backlog of bureaucratic uh, paperwork being shuffled around. I would submit uh, I'm not sure how many of you have been uh, aware of this or saw it in the news. It was uh, in the news uh, quite prominently back in June and July uh, that USCIS was complaining that they're on the verge of bankruptcy. And let me back up a step so that I can explain how this works. Um, USCIS is a division of the federal government that claims that it is funded completely on the fees that it receives. In other words, it doesn't get money from your taxpayer dollars in order to keep on running. That has been the case since it was created. But this year, it complained to the federal government, to Congress, that if it doesn't get emergency funding from the federal government by August of 2020, then it would not have the money to continue operating. And in fact, they issued pink slips, uh, notices that people might be laid off to half of their employees in July because they were not sure that they would be able to continue uh, functioning and paying those employees. Um, I submit that this inordinate number of of rejections and requests for evidence and bureaucratic slowdowns is causing uh, a lot more work to pile up for those employees than they can handle given the amount of funds that come in from the feeds. Uh, whether this is a deliberate strategy to close down this form of legal immigration 
or whether this is just a, uh, an externality, a byproduct of this kind of um, stringent uh, uh, analysis of each of these applications, I, I don't know, I couldn't tell you, but I wouldn't be surprised if it was part of a much larger, and I would submit somewhat sinister, uh, policy to reduce legal immigration to the United States. This administration, particularly uh, from the top down, from Trump's uh, announcing that he would be a uh, presidential candidate in 2016, uh, has been anti-immigrant. There is that is just a fact. It is not an opinion. Uh, and uh, Stephen Miller has been the architect behind the scenes, uh, enacting policies that have led to great reduction in the number of immigrants to the United States. Because the number of legal immigrants to the United States is lower, this is also something that is slowing down our economic growth. Um, quite contrary to that, that uh, cartoon that I just spoke about with the, the banker, the blue collar worker and the immigrant in the 20 cookies, immigrants have been and we saw this in our historical overview last time with the uh, expansion of the railroad, have been and continue to be a backbone of our economy in the United States. Um, independent think tanks, that is nonpartisan think tanks, have said that as a result of the decrease in immigrants, our labor force and economic growth uh, is approximately 59% lower as a result of these policies. Um, and that was, by the way, from a report that was prior to the onset of COVID. So this is not just uh, post COVID slowdown. Um, so that's one set of, of policies that have led to major immigration changes. Another one that I've been dealing with uh, and people around the country have been dealing with is the reduction in what's called H-1B visas. H-1B are not immigrant visas usually, they are for temporary work visas. Um, and they're especially made for high skilled foreign labor. Um, during the Trump administration, the rate of H-1B has, of H-1B visas being approved has decreased significantly. And just as with the legal immigration that we were just talking about, there have been denial rates for very, what previously would have been very small uh, oversights on applications, a denial rate that has gone up by 30% uh, starting uh, in 2016 and going up through the beginning of 2020. So we're seeing something that is internal to the United States government that is causing these uh, applications to be denied at a 30% higher rate. Does that mean that other immigration attorneys like myself have gotten worse by 30% since 2016? I don't think that we could attribute it to that. Um, I think that it might have to do with an anti-immigrant policy that is uh, finding reasons to say no to the uh, highly skilled workers that want to come to this country, not permanently, but temporarily to work. A third way of people coming to the United States that we talked about uh, last time, um, in addition to family connections, in addition to work sponsors, uh, is through the asylum and refugee programs. We talked about this last time. I actually wanna make an, a quick correction, a little update to what I said last time. Last time I talked to you about uh, sort of the impetus for our asylum and refugee program. And I talked about the SS St. Louis. Uh, I was correct that it sailed in 1939 from Germany 
Uh, on board, I have some more details for you. On board were 900 Jews from Germany seeking refuge somewhere, anywhere in the world. The ship sailed to Cuba and almost all of the uh, refugees on the boat were denied access to Cuba. It then sailed to the United States. No one was allowed access in the United States. It had to turn around and go back to Europe. Um, the correction that I have to make is that there were some countries such as Belgium uh, and some other European countries that gave safe passage to many of the people that were on board, but 250 of the 900 returned to Germany and many of those uh, perished in the Holocaust. Um, I talked about that ship last time because it was mainly as a result of the, 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 the horrifying news of what took place in Germany during the Holocaust that uh, the United States said, this can never happen again, this should never happen again anywhere in the world. If people are persecuted because of their religion, their ethnicity, their race, their political beliefs, their sexual orientation, um, or for some other reason, then they should have a place where they can go and find safe harbor. And the United States should be one of those places. And so starting after World War II, we enacted an, a policy of asylum and refugee uh, for people that were in fear of their lives in their home countries and had nowhere else to go. Under the Trump administration, the ceiling for refugees, meaning the number of refugees that could come into the United States is 84% lower than it was in the final year of the Obama administration. It went from 110,000 refugees down to 18,000. In 2020, only 7,848 refugees arrived in the United States thus far. So this is a significant change in policy. It's a significant change for immigration in the United States. But it also, I would submit, is a significant change in terms of America's being a beacon of humanitarian relief for people around the world. America has stood for, since at least World War II, uh, has stood for a place where people of all races, creeds, and ethnicities could live and find refuge. And to reduce the number by 84% of people who could come here to find safe refuge from uh, places around the world where they are being threatened is not only a assault upon the immigration system in the United States, but is also tarnishing the reputation of the nation as a beacon of hope and of enlightenment in the world. Something that I've been dealing with the past uh, month, something that's made my life pretty crazy, is um, I told you about how USCIS claimed that they were running out of money one of the things that they chose to do is to increase the fees for applications by 80%. And just to give you one sense of that, let's just look at an application to become a US citizen. So if you've lived here for a certain amount of time and you meet all the qualifications, you can apply to go from being a lawful permanent resident or a green card holder to becoming a US citizen. That application used to be $640. Now, as of October 2nd, that fee will be $1,160. Uh, in August, the Trump administration and the USCIS made this announcement. And since August until now, I have been dealing with a number of people, my clients, who are frantically trying to get their applications in before October 2nd. Um, 
I did not know this a year ago when I uh, said yes to giving these lectures. So as you can imagine, all around me are files of uh, people's applications that need to get in within the next day or else their application fees jump by 80%. So I'm still working on that. Um, let me speak about some of the other things that I've seen as, uh, as an attorney who's representing clients that are also incarcerated. Uh, many of you have heard in the past few years about families being separated at the border. Uh, about so-called kids in cages. Um, there's been a lot of political mudslinging back and forth about this, that the quote unquote cages were built under Obama and that Obama was the deporter in chief, that more people were deported under Obama than, uh, than by any other president and so forth. I will give you my perspective on these things. Uh, having traveled to Texas a number of times to represent clients that have been uh, held in uh, facilities uh, down in Pearsall, Texas, for instance, um, having been to uh, the border uh, in California um, uh, by Tijuana, having seen a, a number of different uh, facilities that are detention centers for uh, immigrants. And having been doing this for 17 years, I've noticed a, a number of changes. So first of all, under Obama, and you might remember that he went on national television during prime time to announce this, he said that no one who is without a criminal record, a serious criminal record, should be picked up by ICE, Immigration Customs Enforcement. Those are sort of the immigration police. Uh, nobody uh, who lacks a serious criminal record should be picked up for deportation. Um, and that was his policy. Uh, as an immigration attorney, especially up here in Boston, uh, when he made that announcement, I was a little bit skeptical. It seemed like a lot of grandstanding because as a matter of fact, nobody with, uh, with, excuse me, nobody without a serious criminal background was being picked up because the immigration system was already overloaded with people who had uh, criminal backgrounds and were being put into deportation. Under Obama, there was uh, usually, when I had a case go to immigration court, there was usually about a year long delay before the case would get heard. We'd have what, what's called a master calendar hearing, which is sort of a procedural hearing. And the judge would say, okay, come back in a year and you know, we'll hear your case. Uh, if, the, if the client was incarcerated, it would be a lot faster. It'd be about a month or maybe two months at the most. Um, under the Trump administration, the delays in having cases has gone to two years or three years. I have cases that are being heard uh, that have a master calendar in 2020 and we're being given dates for 2023. Uh, Boston is one of the cities that has the largest backlog of cases. Under the Trump administration, judges are given a little clock that or a little meter that appears on their computer screen. And it tells them if they are in the green, the yellow or the red because they have a quota of cases that they have to uh, dispense with in a certain amount of time. And the immigration judges uh, union uh, has spoken out about this saying that this is not the way that judges should be operating or the way that judges can make uh, good and just decisions about these cases. This is forcing them to, uh, to fast track things that might be otherwise much more difficult to decide. I've visited these facilities, as I said, close to the border. And under the Obama administration, it is true that quote unquote cages or cells of chain link fence 
were created, but under the Obama administration, there was a policy that said that, uh, that adults and children could not be held in the same uh, detention center together. Anybody who went into one of these other detention centers, these so-called cages, were only allowed to stay there for a maximum of 72 hours until the case could be processed. And then they would, in most cases, if there is no criminal background or any, uh, any evidence, any cre credible evidence of trafficking, uh, the children and the parents would be reunited and uh, set out on bond. And that would mean that they would have to return to immigration court sometime in the future, but they were released on their own recognizance. Under the Trump administration, we were seeing people being held for upwards of five months, uh, children being separated from their parents, and the, um, the administrators who were supposed to be keeping track of who everybody was losing the files so that we have children and we do not know where their parents are. Uh, this is a major change in action. And I would submit that this is a result of policy because the Trump administration came out and said that they were going to have a zero tolerance policy. And what they were eager to do was to uh, to create a disincentive for people to come here from foreign countries. If word got back, so the thinking went, if word got back to people that were coming here from Guatemala, uh, from Brazil, uh, and from other uh, countries south of the border, that when they got here, they would be separated from their children and never see their children again, then there'd be a dis strong disincentive for people to come to the United States. What do we find, however? We find that people are still coming to the United States in uh, very large numbers. And I want you to think about this for a moment. Don't even think about the fact that people are coming to the United States and being separated at the border from their families and perhaps never even seeing their parents again. Let's put that aside for a moment. When people immigrate to the United States, legally or uh, illegally, when they come here, they're automatically on the bottom rung of society. If they're here without documents, they are the most bottom rung of society. They do not have any way that they can legally work. They are subject to being exploited by their employers by their landlords, by anybody that they know. Uh, they are subject to being exploited by scam artists who claim that they're gonna help them with their immigration work. They are the very bottom rung of our American society. And it's extremely scary and precarious for them. I've seen it firsthand. It should cause you to ask this question. Why would anybody leave their country to come to the United States if they are being put at such a vulnerable position? And the answer to that is very simple. It's worse where they come from. It is worse where they come from. What I see on a routine basis is people coming here seeking asylum because there is no central government in their countries that can stop the gangs from taking their children and creating new gang members out of their children. They don't want that for their children. They can't uh, prevent these gangs from raiding and, and, and pilfering from their uh, legitimate businesses. They can't stop these gangs from uh, going up to grandmothers who got their retirement check and making the grandmothers give them a cut of it. There is rampant crime and gang activity in these countries that is causing fear for people that are fleeing to the United States. And the only reason people would make such a precarious travel 
over so many hundreds of miles to come to the United States only to be at the bottom rung of society is because it's worse where they came from. So this program of trying to disincentivize the immigration to the United States has not worked. And all it has done is create terror and fear and heartbreak for people who have already been through some of the worst atrocities that you could imagine. That's one of the things that I'm seeing on the front lines. Another uh, thing that I see uh, in a very different way is that the current administration has populated the Board of Immigration Appeals. So the way it works is there's the immigration court. Actually, I should, I should back up to explain this because maybe this is not clear to everybody. You recall from your civics lessons in grammar school that the United States is a uh, system of government with checks and balances. We all remember that. Well, what does that mean? That means that there's three branches of government. There's the executive branch, the legislative branch, and the judicial branch. Uh, you all probably recall that. The judicial branch would be the courts. The legislative branch would be uh, the Senate and Congress. And the executive branch would be the office of the president on down. So if I were to give you a test right now and say, under which of those three branches would the immigration courts fall into, all of you might say the judicial branch because they're judges and all of you would be wrong because the immigration courts are set up not as part of an article three having to do with the constitution court, but under article one under the executive branch. It is part of the, according to our law today, it is part of the executives, that's the president's uh, responsibilities to decide what the borders of our nation are like. And as part of those responsibilities, the president gets to set up the immigration courts. So the way the, um, the hierarchy goes is from the president to the attorney general, right now Bill Barr, to the BIA, the Board of Immigration Appeals, down to the immigration courts in all of the different cities throughout the United States. So one of the things that's been happening in the past four years is that the attorney general, who is, as you know, hired by the president, gets to assign who sits on the Board of Immigration Appeals. And so there has been a very strong anti-immigrant uh, pressure, you might say, for the Board of Immigration Appeals to decide cases. And so one of the things that I'm dealing with today and have been dealing with for the past uh, three or four years is that a lot of the cases that we lose at the immigration court level, we then appeal to the Board of Immigration Appeals, and then we lose there. What happens next to that case? If we decide to appeal that, it gets taken from these Article I courts under the executive branch, under the president, and it goes to an Article III court, a, what, what I might call a uh, proper court, and it goes to the uh, Federal First Circuit Court of Appeals. The judges at the Federal First Circuit Court of Appeals are not appointed by the president or by the attorney general, and they are supposedly at least not subject to the political pressures and vicissitudes uh, as uh, the, the uh, administration in power would like. So they are supposedly more neutral than the immigration courts or the BIA. So on that level, I'm seeing a lot of cases that are being brought over to the First Circuit and uh, 
that's for here in New England, it would be the Ninth Circuit in California and other circuits around the country. Um, and those courts are almost uh, unanimous in finding that the Trump administration policies, such as the, what you might have heard as the Arab ban, uh, uh, those sorts of policies are not justified and are not legal. So there is a problem with the immigration court system in that it is completely at the, uh, the I won't say at the whim of the president, but are influenced by the president's uh, current temperament. There are other issues that um, I'm having to deal with on a very daily basis. And that has to do with how these, uh, these cases are being decided uh, even on the immigration court level. Um, one thing that you may or may not know is that everybody who's brought into immigration court is not necessarily guilty of a crime. The crossing of the border is a misdemeanor and up until uh, the Trump administration wasn't prosecuted as a crime. Um, and there's very good reason why it wasn't prosecuted as a crime. If somebody commits a crime and is being prosecuted for that, what do they get in the United States? Now, I know you are all on mute, so you can't all be jumping up and telling me that they would be get a court appointed attorney if they don't have the money for their own attorney but I know you're all about to tell me that, uh, but that's true. If they had committed a crime and were being prosecuted for committing a crime and they couldn't afford their own attorney, then they would get one at the cost to the taxpayer dollar. But immigration law is not considered criminal. It's considered a civil offense. And as such, the people who show up in immigration court, not one of them is entitled to a court appointed attorney if they can't afford one. And so the numbers between the people who are represented by an attorney and the people who are not are very disparate. So in the immigration court level, the numbers that I've been seeing are that 70, 30, that uh, people who do not have an immigration attorney have a 70% greater chance of losing their case than those who do have an immigration attorney. Um, that means that what's happening in these courts is not exactly about justice, it's about access to justice or the lack of access to justice. Because just because a person can't afford an attorney doesn't mean that they don't have a good case to stay in the United States. So we're seeing that there's a political problem with the structure of the immigration courts. And we're seeing that there is a problem with access to justice among those who are being hauled into the immigration courts because they don't get court appointed attorneys. Um, during the uh, Democratic debates, you might remember during the primary debates, there was uh, some discussion about uh, making crossing the border illegal or making it legal. And I had a very unusual position. Nobody was, uh, none of the candidates would espouse to it. But my position was, uh, let's make all of immigration uh, illegal, a crime. So if you went to the United States, Let's make that a crime because then everybody would get access to a court appointed attorney. Of course, that's never going to happen because that would mean that your tax dollars and my tax dollars would be spent to defend people who have entered the United States uh, illegally and to prevent them from going back. And I don't think that would be a very popular position in this day and age. Um, 
I want to leave some time at the end of this, and I see that a number of people have some questions. Um, but there were a few other topics that I wanted to discuss about immigration in terms of um, how we might be able to make it better going forward. Uh, there was a, a plan called the DREAM Act that was put forward under Obama. Um, the, the House of Representatives had signed on to it, but the Senate refused to even give it a hearing. So it was dead in the water. Um, that's when President Obama at the time put through the executive order for DACA and for DAP, Deferred Action for Parents. DAP, as we talked about last time, got stopped in a Texas court. DACA is still uh, uh, alive and kicking, although kind of on uh, uh, life support because the Trump administration has gone after it and tried to, uh, tried to stop it. Um, a federal court has said that the Trump administration cannot stop DACA. That is, it is a legal policy. And so it is continuing, but it only helps a very small fragment of those children who were brought here to the United States because you had to be brought here between certain years. Um, and that excludes a lot of people who've entered since then. Um, I am very hopeful that given all of the attention and discussion that immigration law has gotten over the past four years, that in the next four years, we will see some radical change to immigration policy. Um, as I mentioned earlier, having more immigrants come into the United States would be good for the economy. One sector of the economy that's important to me um, is colleges and universities. Uh, the demographics are such that, uh, as you probably know, uh, the baby boomer generation was one of the largest generations to go to college. And then there was what's called the echo boomer. The children of the baby boomers made another big uh, uh, ups, uh, uptick in the number of students going to college in America. But since then, the demographics are going down. We have far fewer uh, college age students uh, ready to go to college now than almost ever before. And one of the things that could uh, keep our colleges and universities going, and they are among the best in the, the world, is having more students from foreign countries. Um, so one of the things that I think we need to do is have a radical overhaul of the immigration policy make it possible for people who are here right now to become legal uh, and to uh, get the documents that they need in order to work, in order to drive. Uh, something that you might not be aware of in Massachusetts, it, unlike Rhode Island, our neighboring uh, state, um, in Massachusetts, if you don't have proper documentation as an immigrant, you can't get a driver's license. And as you all probably know, if you don't have a driver's license, you can't get car insurance. I think it's in all of our best interests to have everybody on the road be licensed to drive and to have car insurance. But for some reason, the Massachusetts legislature has not adopted that position. Rhode Island has, and they've seen a significant decrease in the number of uh, car accidents and also the number of uninsured accidents. Um, there's a lot of other policy changes that I, uh, I talked too much in order to uh, get to now, but I'd like to open it up for your questions. I can't hear anybody. Did somebody have a question? Should I look at the chat? Let me look at the chat icon here. Okay. I, think, I think Jennifer's ready to give them to you now. Okay, I'm ready. Well, can this be changed? Do you think if Trump gets reelected, can anything be made different? Okay, I, who's asking that? Uh, Barbara Ritz. Hi, Barbara. Hi. Um, Barbara, if Trump gets reelected, will anything change? Um, I seriously doubt it um, uh, because 
right now, I mean, it, it would it would definitely depend on what the, the numbers are like in Congress uh, and in the Senate. Uh, but right now, there are not the numbers in order to pass a large scale overhaul of uh, immigration policy. And not only that, but um, I'm not going to say that the Republicans and the Democrats are so far apart. I'm going to say that Trump and the Trumpians and the Democrats are very far apart, mm -hmm. uh, as you may know, um, and many of you may know. Uh, Republican policy, uh, the Republican Party with a capital R, their policy for many, many years has been pro-immigrant. Um, Ronald Reagan from California was pro-immigrant. Uh, immigration, as um, most uh, think tanks would agree, is good for the economy, and Republicans like to see the economy humming along. Uh, migrant workers are crucial to the the uh, the harvesting of crops in California, and also along uh, our eastern seaboard, the the uh, harvesting of apples around this time of year, etc. So I think that it's a, a standoff right now between Trump and the Democrats. Um, and I don't think that if Trump was reelected, we'd see much of a change. <sighs> Who else? Or should I read from the chat? Is USCIS also in charge of the global entry application process, which is currently almost on hold? Um, so this is from Alan and Elizabeth, um, could you explain what you mean by the global entry application process? Yes, it's a process, you know, we are uh, US citizens and uh, we travel out abroad and we have this uh, special uh, global entry. So when, you, we, when we come back to the US, we can uh, uh, go for a special line without waiting for long lines for the uh, immigration. Oh, right, and, right, right. Uh, we have to renew it, and it has been pending for months and months, and these right, right. centers are closed. And, uh, right. Uh, so. Um, so, actually, no, uh, USCIS is not in charge of that. That's actually under the Department of State. Okay. And uh, the Department of State, I'm not sure, actually, this is uh, the first that I'm hearing about this being uh, on hold. I don't know if that has to do with um, COVID or not. But uh, the the Department of State is the ones in charge of that. So okay. thank you for that question. Thank you. Um, I see another question. What was the rationale for putting kids and parents in separate cages? So I think that there could be a, 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 an exp a, a rationale that explains this, um, which is you don't want to have small children uh, in in a detention center where they are susceptible to being abused by adults. That makes sense. But having children in these, uh, these detention centers for weeks and months on end, where they are responsible for caring for each other, a 15-year-old caring for a two-year-old and so forth, that does not make any sense to me. And I think it's just part of an overall uh, plan to try to disencourage people from coming to the United States because we do horrible things to immigrants. But the guards are adults. The guards who take care of the children are adults and there have been abuses. That's true. That is true. Um, that is why, I mean, this has been uh, derogatorily uh, described as the catch and release program, but that's why people were released and released under their own recognizance if they did not have a criminal background or any suspicion of being uh, uh, human traffickers, uh, there was no reason to keep them in cages where they would be actually more susceptible to abuse than if they were released on their own. I'd like to go back to the question about will this change? I think that uh, Trump is not a president of as we have known. And I think he's a racist, and I don't care, you can all boo me. And I think that um, his base, this so-called base that probably never voted until him, 
because he was different and he said outrageous things, his bass loves this. So he will always play to the bass. He's a disgusting liar. He's not my president. <laughs> well, That's how I really that. feel. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for that. Um, so there's, uh, there's a number of questions about judges. Uh, how long are immigration court judges placed in their positions? How are judges on the Immigration Board of Appeals chosen? Aren't all federal judges appointed by the president? Um, uh, so those three questions, let me deal with those. Immigration judges, um, in the first two years that you are placed as an immigration judge, you are on probation, basically. And that means you could lose your job if uh, you don't meet certain standards. And that, in my humble opinion, is rife for political pressure. Um, if Bill Barr doesn't like the way that you're doing your job, meaning you're allowing too many people to uh, stay here and not deporting enough, maybe you could lose your job within those two years. In fact, I have a case that is uh, dealing with that right now. Uh, after those two years, uh, it's my understanding that they are, are there for life. There's not a certain uh, um, uh, tenure of appointment. Um, how are the judges on the Immigration Board of Appeals chosen? Those are appointments that are made either by the uh, attorney general or by the administration. And aren't, the question is, aren't all federal judges appointed by the president? Uh, no, they have to be vetted by Congress. And this is one of the things that um, has created quite an uproar is that there used to be a filibuster for uh, federal judges to be appointed and that got uh, that was um, over overruled or voted out, I believe, in 2000, uh, uh, was it 2014? I might be wrong on that. And as a result, um, many of these federal judges, um, even if there's not unanimous agreement, are being put onto the benches. Um, do, the next question from Sue Davis is, do you know if there has been a full accounting or a reconciliation of children in detention separated from parents? The last time that I uh, read about this, there were still literally hundreds of children whose parents have not been uh, uh, connected with them. And we don't know where they are or what happened to them. Um, I can tell you as a very practical matter, if a person gets deported from the United States, it becomes very difficult to find out where that person is and to communicate with that person. And so if children were uh, kept in detention while their parents were going through immigration proceedings and then their parents were deported, it is not surprising that uh, even well-meaning people in the United States government wouldn't be able to find who those parents are or where they are or communicate with them. Uh -huh. <clears throat> I, and and I'm, I'm just going to give my own personal opinion on this. I fear uh, that uh, sometime in the future, there will be a very large class action lawsuit by those children once they become adults. And the, the United States government will be uh, found to be owing them millions upon millions of dollars uh, for for what has been done to them. There's already certain class action lawsuits that are that are in the process, but uh, I don't think that that is going to be the end of it. Other questions? Yes. Can I ask, ask a question about uh, the current status of people who have been attempting to cross the border illegally. Back in 2019, there were almost a million people who were apprehended. Um, and then things changed so that those people were supposed to be held in Mexico. Is that correct? And can you tell us anything about that? How well they're being treated and so on? Sure. So let's also define our terms. Paul, right? Yeah, yeah that's right. OK. So um, crossing illegally, let's be clear about what that means. A person who does not have permission to enter the United States can, by US law, go to a port of entry. And what that means is a border crossing area and present him or herself 
and say, I am fleeing from persecution in my home country. I would like to apply for asylum to the United States. That is what the, uh, the US law allows for. Um, they will be put into deportation proceedings, but they have done nothing illegal, just to be clear about that. Um, then there are other people who might enter into the United States um, somehow else, where there's not a port of entry. They might cross over the border uh, and, you know, uh, quote unquote, sneak into the United States and then get apprehended sometime later. That is an illegal crossing, but they still have the same rights as the first person. In other words, when they're brought into immigration court, uh, they can present their case for asylum or refugee status. Uh, the Trump administration tried to make it so that people could not do that and they had to wait for a certain time in Mexico before being allowed to do that. Uh, this made it very difficult, if not impossible, for the few of them who could afford attorneys or had pro bono attorneys to confer with their attorneys because they weren't in the United States where the US attorneys are. Uh, and my understanding is that some federal judges found this to be illegal, but I think that the question is still working its way through the courts right now, uh, whether or not they can be held in a different country. Um, the Trump administration also placed a new requirement on people seeking asylum and said, you first have to apply for asylum in one of the countries that you crossed through to get here, whether that be Mexico or uh, you know, Ecuador, if you, whatever country you came through, you have to apply there before you can apply for asylum here. That also is being hotly contested in the courts. Uh, but that's a, a very good question. Other questions? Question. Yes, Santo. Yeah. Yes, uh, if a uh, pregnant woman enters the United States illegally, she has a child who is now a citizen, I believe. That's right. Can the mother now claim eligibility for citizenship because her child is a citizen? That's a great question. That used to be the case back in the 80s. Uh -huh. uh, these were so-called anchor babies and people who come here in order to yeah. Uh, have a child in the United States and then fill out the documentation that that child is applying for their mother or their father or whatever. Uh, under Reagan, that was changed. Oh. The child who's born in the United States and is, as you say, a U.S. citizen cannot apply for his or her parents until he or she turns 21. Oh, I see. So there is no such thing as a, as a quote unquote anchor baby anymore. I see, thank you. Good question, good question. Any other questions? I'm happy to take them. If not, let me tell you what my email address is in case you do think of a question and you want me to follow up. Um, my email address is Jason, J-A-S-O-N, at J G Esquire spelled out E S Q U I R E dot com. Jason at J G Esquire dot com. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. There's a lot of information that I wanted to present today. And I know that as soon as I hit leave meeting, I'm going to think about all the things that I wanted to say. But we only had an hour <laughs> together. Um, I look forward to when our next time together is, and I hopefully uh, will be with you in person in Carlisle. Uh, and I'll, I'll be glad to meet with any of you across the street at that little uh, cafe Burn. Burn. that has the Burn. sandwiches, <laughs> and the good coffee, and maybe we can sit outside if it's warm enough and uh, have a little talk about any of these topics. Yes, Loretta. That's a long time from now because we're not going to be able to meet in person, in my opinion, till about this time next year, maybe. In the meantime, this is all so frightening to me. Other than vote, 
what can individual people do? I pay attention, but it's a big world out there. What do we do first? Does anybody care? Maybe we don't want immigrants. I think we are the beacon, but we've stopped being everything under this administration. What shall we do? What can I do between now and November 3rd? What Thank you, Loretta. I think, I think that's a great question. Um, I don't have a great answer for you. I think that what, what can you do? Well, you're, you're starting it right now. You're here and you're getting informed. Uh, I think that's good. And I also believe that uh, maintaining our individual integrity is very important. You know, uh, uh, the, uh, the famous book, um, Banality of Evil, uh, has the, you know, it looks at uh, what happened in Germany under Hitler. And the conclusion it had was that evil is only allowed to prevail when good people don't do anything. And I think that maintaining our own integrity is extremely important. And uh, to, to speak up, to uh, help out if you see a person in need, and uh, to uh, continue doing what you're doing, which is getting educated about what the facts are and not uh, falling prey to the propaganda. Thank you. My pleasure. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for spending this hour with me. Um, I think you all should go for a nice socially distant walk outside under the beautiful <laughs> autumn leaves of Carlisle or wherever you might be right now. Yeah. And um, I, do, I, I, I do hope that Loretta is wrong and that we will see each other in person sometime in the near future. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. Thank you. Lovely to see you again. Bye-bye. Right. Thank all you right. all for coming. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye.